We've had sequential declines in retail sales. Mm -hmm. Incentives aren't budging. We know that production is falling. I'm trying to wrap my head around what happens next. The irony of casting a light on General Motors to the extent that President Trump did is that it actually made things worse. Welcome to The Exchange. I'm Ash Bennington. Today we're here with Danielle DiMartino Booth and Daniel Ruiz. We're going to talk autos and employment. Why don't you get us started? Tell us the story of how we got to where we are right now. I'm very excited to be sitting here next to Danielle. She's very much in tune with the job market, uh, the mac macroeconomics. And one of the things that she just out of the blue sent to me one day was the Challenger job cut, um, automotive job cuts report. Yep. So I asked for historical data on the Challenger report, and I started charting, um, going back as far as I possibly could, see if there was any correlation, if I can somehow tie the, uh, the thesis behind increasing uh, automotive job cuts, leading the overall unemployment rate. Sure enough, there was very hard evidence. Um, and ever since then, we've just kind of been in, in constant communication. Mm -hmm. We've uh, collaborated several times. And like I said, I'm super excited to be here. I, this is a really interesting conversation. It's all mutual, yes. <laughs> Be because we have we have Danielle who does top down global macro. We have Daniel who does bottom up U.S. domestic analytics in a particular sector. So this is a really interesting conversation. Daniel, what was it that you that you? Well, so you know, I, I I looked at Daniel's research as being the best on the domestic automobile industry, and it, it kind of flashed onto my radar eight nine months ago that. All of a sudden, we were starting to see weakness in Chinese car sales. And then one month became two, became three. Now we're at 10. So, you know, I said, well, given Daniel's evidence and data on growing inventories here and what's happening in China, what does this imply for the global economy? Mm. So I did a deep dive. And what I found was just beyond eye-opening. The, the global automobile sector has been in an expansion for two decades now. Hmm. If you can imagine, the growth has been largely attributable to the growth of registered drivers in China. They have doubled in the space of six years to 350 million drivers. There'll be 400 million registered Chinese drivers by the end of this year, which equates to the populations of the United States and Germany combined. Now, the, the Chinese government has done a ton. They, they've had two solid years. If you can, can you imagine cash for clunkers for two years? <laughs> That's what they've had in China, literally. They've pulled such magnificent amounts of demand forward that they're now suffering the right. backlash of that. And it was, the, it, it was watching Germany melt down that really planted the seed for me. I said, what is going on here? And then you look and you see that the ties between the German manufacturing monster, right? They, they produce twice as many cars as the United States. Third mm. largest exporting nation in the world. $270 billion of auto exports every year. And an economy that is deeply reliant on its 800,000 directly employed auto workers and then everything that's related to them and they're all producing internal combustion engine cars. Hmm. So, you know, it's interesting that the cover of Bloomberg Businessweek uh, talks about what the implications are of the shift to electric vehicles. The Chinese government has basically laid the law down and said, you will buy EV cars, period, end. You hmm. will be penalized for buying internal combustion engines. And we see that Germany is effectively in recession. I mean, their ISM, their manufacturing survey came out at 44.7 in March. Mm -hmm. That's not hairline, you know, that's, that's not borderline with 50, which denotes the difference between expansion and contraction. It's right. deep in contractionary territory. And all of this has to do with the manufacturing of cars. So when you, when you put it all together, if there's a slowdown in the United States domestic market, Right. On top of what's of Germany going into recession, on top of China being incapable, despite pumping eight hundred billion dollars 
of stimulus into their economy in this year's first quarter. That's an extraordinary number. Mm. But that's to small and medium enterprises. Their cash for clunkers is running out of gas, so to speak. <laughs> so if the U.S. car industry does go into a slump, which is why I'm relying so much more on Daniel's research of late, right. you're talking about a, a, a turn in, in a secular expansion that that that's going to come to a screeching halt after 20 years. Uh, so that tees it up perfectly for you, Daniel. I, that, Daniel paints a very grim macro framework picture. You have the Chinese stealing future demand, right, with stimulus. You've got a uh, secular shift from, uh, from, from a policy perspective, from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. You've got one of the major exporting nations potentially dipping into a significant recession. How does that square with what you're seeing bottom up in the U.S. automotive sector? So first of all, I, I don't disagree with anything that Danielle said. I think her macro research is outstanding. Um, I think she paints it perfectly. The, the thing that I would imagine viewers are thinking right now is, why are stocks not reflecting the dire situation that, that's just been painted? And I think part of the reason is because when you, when you look at the financials of these companies, particularly the ones in the US that sell cars worldwide, the bulk of their earnings are here in the U.S. Mm. So if the U.S. is perceived to be healthy, then we can brush off, you know, overseas um, weakness. But it's not healthy. Mm. And, and just to, to go back for one quick second to, to really, really point out just how important the U.S. is, Danielle and I had a conversation about this a couple days ago. 109% of Ford's total company EBIT came from North America last year. 86% of General Motors total company EBIT, this includes the Finco, North America. FCA, 86% of total company yep. EBIT, North America. So that would explain the reason why everyone's kind of, you know, the heartbeats aren't raised, mm. so to speak. But when you take a really, really deep look at what's happening and you look beyond the, the headline numbers, you know, the, the, the SAR that, that the everyone- seasonal adjustment factors. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, that, you know, a lot of folks are pointing towards uh, in March. The bottom line is we're down 133,000 vehicles this year. If you run that through for the next three quarters, that's a little north of a half a million cars. And where is that relative to aggregate production numbers? So that's a really great question. And th this is where the analysis gets very tricky too. There is no margin for error, hmm. okay? And that's where investing in autos gets really, really detailed and it, and it can really, really trick investors. As long as inventory levels are okay, hmm. a manufacturer can miss sales by small percentages for months on end. All that happens is inventory starts increasing doesn't show up on the earnings report because their production is steady. It's when it gets to the critical level right. where they can no longer miss sales, where the sales no longer supports the production rate, that production gets cut, and that's when it hits the bottom line. And that's where we're at. So your view has always been that these inventory numbers are critical because it's a number that's not really fudgeable, right? It's a way that you actually see what's happening with right. the financial health and terminal demand simultaneously. Is that... Yeah, and I focus, that, that's a great point too. So if you look at inventory alone, that's a very one-dimensional data point. Mm. Because as long as the sales rate supports the amount of inventory, inventory can rise, that's not an issue. It's when the, the sales rate no longer supports the amount of inventory that you have a problem. Then you have to cut back. So that's why you look at it on a day count basis, right? And exactly, the... yeah. And I use a rolling 12-month, preferably, to take the seasonality out of it completely right. and, and really get a good feel for, for what's happening and if inventory levels are appropriate. You know, it's interesting because when Daniel brought these inventory levels that were ticking up to my attention, yeah, I, 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 this is probably six weeks ago or so, I said, well, why is the Chicago PMI, the Chicago Manufacturing Survey, so, so strong hmm. if there's this buildup going on in the background? And it was shortly thereafter that Wards announced uh, that there'd been a 4.2% production cut in the month of February. Mm -hmm. um, and I started to notice that jobless claims were ticking up in the big 10 auto manufacturing states. And lo and behold, the Chicago PMI came out for March. Mm -hmm. And the future inventories number, I, I was blowing up your phone that morning, the future inventories number swung from positive to negative 
to the greatest extent in the history of the survey that goes back to 1946. Mm. Future inventories is confidence in future demand, basically. And what we saw this last week with initial jobless claims dropping to 196,000, the lowest in 50 years before I was even born, and that's saying something, I'm no spring chicken. But one state flipped, and that was the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. up 16% mm -hmm. over last year, jobless claims. So to Daniel's point, when change happens, when these critical thresholds that he's describing occur, change happens fast. Mm -hmm. Very fast, and it's been building up. And in typical fashion, I brought a couple of charts. Mm -hmm. The one that I'll touch on first is the 12 month rolling day supply of total vehicles, and then um, just trucks alone, just a truck segment alone. And as you can see in the chart, total vehicles are now at the same day supply level that they were back in December of 2008. Mm -hmm. So in the heart of the recession, truck day supply is the highest since June of 2008. This is incredibly important because our nation has completely shifted demand towards trucks, right? right? And it's the highest margin segment right. of the- Absolutely. Trucks equals yeah. profit. Absolutely. So what does this tell us about what's actually happening in the underlying state of the economy? This is a message that most of our viewers aren't getting anywhere else, this notion that- Well, and that's, I think, where Daniel's work it really shines is because he looks past the fleet sales that flatter the data. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, Danielle, you have to focus on retail sales, which were down, what, 4% in March and 4% for the date. quarter as a whole and 1% for last year as a whole. Yep. I like to call it, uh, you know, torturing data. I'm sure that's been, you know, used <laughs> before. <laughs> but, you know, these seasonal adjustments kind of throw people off. Basically, all they said is that if there was one additional day in March, then we would have sold more cars when in fact we were down 3%. Hmm. But Danielle and I chuckled about this too because the fact of the matter is they don't count Sundays as selling days, right? And the reason why is because there's 12 states. 12 states that are absolute blue laws. You may never open on a Sunday. And then there's another six where it's, you know, you can only, in Texas, you can only open every other Sunday. But you're talking about 18 states out of, hello? Ridiculous. Right, but the, but the rule applies to all. And I've, and I've worked in both markets. I've worked in blue, state, blue law markets and non-blue law markets. And let me tell you what the fact is. When you're closed on Sunday, all that means is you're gonna be busier on Saturday and busier on Monday. Right. Yeah. That is it. We have to focus on the year-to-date numbers. We have to focus, as Danielle said, on retail numbers because we're focusing on the consumer. The funny thing about fleet that a lot of folks don't talk about is that it is incredibly, incredibly dependent on used car values, which mm. I think are in danger this year. Longer story. The moment used car values drop, fleet sales drop off a cliff. If you look at if you look at fleet sales prior to the recession, I mean they got cut in half year over year when things got really bad. So we can't rely on that. We need to focus on the consumer. We need to focus on right. what's happening in the retail market. Mm. And what was the weakest single aspect in the inflation data this month? Used car prices crashed. I mean, just remarkable just in the data that we've gotten out here in the last few days on the CPI and the PPI. They're both being dragged down by used cars. So this is what's so interesting is the synthesis of these varying data points and different ways of approaching the world. So you essentially are seeing kind of distortion in some of the data that's being officially reported and, and attempting to cut through that by looking at a truer reflection of what underlying demand is. Right. And conversely, you have Danielle looking at the numbers uh, through, through the, the, the actually in the tables deconstructing them and seeing right. things that are actually relatively similar, almost identical. Because I like to sit on government websites. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. I need to get out more. You might refer to me as like ultra micro, you know? And, and granular is not granular enough. <laughs> and and the reason why is because I I need to my my thought process, my research process is literally eliminating all noise and finding out what the silver bullet is. What is holding it all up? And then I, I focus on that. And the second chart I brought was um, a little bit of a deeper dive into what specific vehicles um, are most important in the US market and to the US automakers. So the first is the Ford F-150, which represents 37% of Ford's total production wow. in, in North America, okay? Their day supply is at 84. If you look at the three years uh, back to back, doesn't look that bad. Um, 
but remember, I put 2017 there for a reason, and it's because that's the year that um, that manufacturers cut production. Mm. In 2018, um, none of those, n nothing in the 80s is good. 60 to 70 is ideal. And there was a supplier fire which helped with Ford F-150 inventory, so we shouldn't assume that the number in uh, at the beginning of April is a healthy number in 2018. But as we move on to the others, they really start jumping off the page. So Silverado has a day supply now of 128 days, hmm. right? Gosh. Sierra has a day supply of 109 days. Those two trucks alone represent 24% of General Motors production in 2018. So volume and profit. And very, very important. And a greater percentage of the profits based on the margins on those Exactly. Oh, what? exactly. The, the average truck is, what, $47,000, $48,000? Exactly. Mm -hmm. these, these, these vehicles are critically important and more so than any other of the other models that they carry in their lineup. FCA, which is a huge focus for me right now because I think they're the, the first ones. I, I think they will, they will paint the picture for what's to come for the others very, very well. Now, why is that? Why is, do you see FCA as leading? Because they're they're in the most critical situation in my in my opinion, um, my wholesale estimates have them down uh, in production by double digits in Q1, but double digits in in the in the vehicles that hurt, meaning mm. trucks. There is no favorable mix there. It is trucks. They're down double digits in trucks, um, and that's a wake up call. That's a wake up call for for FCA investors. And again, going back to the chart, I've just told you that they're down double digits in manufacturing in, in production right? Truck production specifically. Their Ram pickup truck has 134 days worth of supply and their Wrangler has 112 days worth of supply. Those two vehicles combined are 33% of their total production volume in 2018. So we're going to see more production cuts is your bottom line. Yeah, not only production cuts, but production cuts where they hurt. Right. You know, it was really interesting in the latest uh, payroll report that we saw uh, auto manufacturing hours worked decline. And if you look over the last three months, you've kind of gone from a rate of two and a half percent to the last three months on an annualized basis, you're running at 14% decline in auto workers. And it, it, if that doesn't work, if cutting their hours doesn't work, then you write the pink slips. Right. And, and they're feed throughs on that, right? They're not going effects that come from, because so, they're high paying jobs. Exactly. These are high paying manufacturing jobs. And if you look at the challenger data that come out monthly after retail, which we know is a beleaguered sector and industrials in general, we're hearing that, that trucking is weakening very quickly. The third biggest category of job cuts thus far in 2019 is the auto sector. Hmm. And what sort of uh, next order effects do you foresee coming off of that if we continue to see the declines that Daniel's data suggest? Well, what you need is a bounce back in sales. Uh, you need kind of a cash for clunkers or something. And I don't even say that tongue in cheek hmm. because what what you, if you're talking about a bounce back in sales, because we typically have consumption come roaring back in the second quarter right. based on tax refunds. Hmm. And what we know thus far this year is that tax refunds are down 4% over 2018. And it's not so much that people necessarily net net have less money in their pockets, households. It's that uh, H&R Block did a survey that showed that 80% of Americans didn't alter their withholding when they should have, meaning 80% got a big old surprise when they went to go file their taxes. Right. And instead of saying, push the button, I want my refund, you're looking across somebody at Jackson Hewitt or wherever, and they're like, no, no, you owe taxes. And they're like, what? Don't push the button. So it, UBS came out with a report a few days ago that said versus their initial estimates, they've had to take down what they anticipate households receiving in tax refunds by $25 billion dollars. In addition to that, you've seen gas prices go up by about 50 cents a gallon. That's another 65 or so billion dollars out of households' pockets. And then you have the, the third insult to injury, and that's that come, come tax day, that so many Americans are gonna be having to pay taxes when they were receiving refunds last year. So I'll give you one mm. quick anecdote. Uh, February and March are seasonally always the best, strongest months out of the year for households who maybe have fallen delinquent on their mortgages catching up. Right. This was the first February in 12 years that they saw mortgage delinquencies rise. 
because the money that they were expecting in the refunds just wasn't there. I've been chatting with, uh, in your home state, a CPA in, in, in New Jersey who you know, works with, with high-earning couples, $200,000, say, and um, total income. And he said, basically, if you compare last year to this year, it's a $5,000 swing. Hmm. Last year, they would have gotten a $2,000 refund. This year, they're paying $3,000 in taxes. Hmm. We're and, a consumption-driven that... economy. People are not buying more cars if they're having to pay taxes that they never anticipated having to pay out of their savings. And is that reflective of changes in the way that the structure of, of withholding and not anticipating, not planning? It's all part of the tax bill. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, there are a lot of uh, corners of the media that have had just there. This is so much. There's hashtag tax scam. Uh, because there's there's this backlash movement against the administration because all of these people are getting rude awakenings. Right. And it's not so much, again, their paychecks were marginally higher throughout 2018, and it, 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 there was a feel-good effect there. And we know that wage inflation finally kicked in last year. But by the same token, we're beginning to see a reversal of that. We've seen wage inflation slip on a three-month annualized basis from 3.6% in October to 3%. We've seen the number of high paying jobs in October. They, they were 177,000. It slipped down to 103,000 in the most recent jobs report. So my point is a lot of the elements that boosted auto sales to where they were only down 1% on the retail side in 2018, as in larger paychecks, um, lower gas prices, a lot of these elements have simply disappeared with wage growth slowing. So where are you gonna get the bump in Q2 auto sales to prevent further production cuts. And I'd love to follow up on that, if I, if I may, because this is the kind of stuff that matters. You know, it's, it's what fuel does a consumer have to consume? And- Down payment. Down payment, that's mm -hmm. part of it. The other part is last year, we had a tremendously strong used vehicle uh, value performance, abnormally strong. We haven't actually had a normal depreciating, um, you know, curve as far as used car values are concerned. The three year in particular, the one that I follow most closely, in two years. If you think about it, 2017, we had an abnormal bump in September because of the hurricanes. Harvey. 2018, we had an abnormal bump mid year um, because new car manufacturers, as I predicted, cut incentives for the first time in 54 months. So that created an, uh, a gravitational pull on used car values. Mm -hmm. And this year, I just sent Danielle this a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. the, the depreciation curve for three-year-old cars, although the data was very good in March and it's still improving in April, it's underperforming the previous five years. So for people who don't follow the space as closely as you do, what's yep. the significance of that data? Why does the used car valuation matter so much? It's critically important. Yeah. And the reason why is because the majority of new vehicle transactions include a trade-in. Right. So the more your vehicle's worth, the more buying power you have. It's really that simple. It's part of the transaction. The new vehicle market is fueled by replacement demand. I got this old one. I want your new one. The more my old one is worth, the more new I can buy. Yeah. Or more, or more, or more frequently I can buy, too. I, I mean, just, just a personal anecdote. You know, I, I, I knew from studying the data that luxury sedan values were really going to take a hit. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, you know, I, I was like, you know what, I think it's time to trade this car in. Like now, <laughs> I, I expedited my decision to buy a new car, my first new car in 20 years. I expedited my decision and rushed to trade the Audi in because I knew that the used car, I knew that I would get less for trading if I waited. Right. And so there are all these linkages effectively of course. That are creating these. Well, and the other, the other, which I discussed on the on the very first interview, not the first, the second, the first one was a few years back, is time to equity. Well, used car values are performing well, but again, when you look at these things as just one piece of the puzzle, it becomes one dimensional. Despite the fact that used car values are performing better in March and April, time to equity is now at 34 months. So past the peak in 2017. And it's purely because the cohort of folks that are that I follow for this year to fuel the demand, paid a higher interest rate when they bought vehicles three years ago, and they took out longer loan terms, which just means that if used car values are on par with last year, it's gonna take them longer to get to equity because it takes longer for you to, to for, for, the, uh, for the used car value to meet the principal balance, to get to the break-even point when you pay a higher interest rate and you take out a longer loan. 
So we have that as a headwind this year as well. Mm -hmm. so, so now that we've set the framework from the macro perspective, from the micro perspective, looking at these data points really closely, what's the significance of it? What does it mean for people who aren't following the automotive sector or macro data as closely as you guys are? What is the significance? What does it mean going forward? What are we likely to see in the next 12 to 24 months? Well, so I think that there's, a, a from a macro perspective, I think that there's a lot of hope on the $800 billion of, of stimulus that was deployed in China, mm -hmm. that that alone, along with the Federal Reserve pivoting and becoming much more dovish on policy, that the combination of these two sources of stimulus would pull the global economy out of this tailspin that it was in. Mm -hmm. And indeed, we saw for the first time in months, uh, Chinese manufacturing, it ticked right above that 50 line and boy, market's been celebrating ever since. So it, it's, it's evidence that the stimulus worked, blah, blah, blah. And out of left field, and, and you know, Germany is like, good God, let China recover, let China rebound. We need these, this market, even though the demand's not going to be there. But out of left field, then we get the administration threatening a tariff war with Europe. <laughs> I mean, Angela Merkel must be like, is my time in office over already? And Mario Draghi's got to be like, where is Rome? Yeah. So uh, you're, you're kicking this economy when it's already on its heels. I know that there's this tremendous groundswell of support for this decoupling theory, but decoupling never works forever. And if you take down the German economy, if China doesn't bounce back, my buddy Leland Miller at the China Beige Book is of the opinion that they're gonna have to come up with more stimulus or China's going to slow again. The United States economy will succumb. We cannot be decoupled from the rest of the world forever, not when we're led by housing and autos, both of which are weakening because U.S. consumption is two-thirds of the economy. U.S. consumption is 17% of global GDP. You have to have a strong U.S. consumer or all bets are off. So, Danny, what do you think? What are you seeing and what do you think that the outlook is based on what you're looking at now? So, as you mentioned, 12, 24 months down the road, um, starting with Danielle's work and, and focusing on jobs. I wish I saw something that, that would, would allow me to say uh, there's going to be improvement down the road. Um, I don't. I don't. With day supply figures as high as they are, and there's a much, much larger theme. As a matter of fact, I wrote a 24-page research report that'll put most people to sleep, but I'm thrilled by it. Um, I got through about half. Did you? <laughs> okay. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> so the, there's a very, very large theme in, in which I think that the sales mix of trucks to cars is going to mean revert, okay? There's a lot of argument out there right now for the strategy of U.S. automakers, some foreign automakers, to switch production to trucks because of profitability, because of margin, and they have taken that and run with it. Here's the funny thing. And boy, have they made friends in the White House for doing <laughs> yes. that, haven't they? And here's, here's the funny thing. So I told you that I was very, very deep in research. And I started going back, 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 back. And what I found is that there are no original thinkers at the helm right now. And I know that might sound harsh, but it's true. It's wow. happened before. We've been here before. In 2005, the, the sales mix of trucks peaked at 59%. And at the, at the end of the recession, it bottomed at 40%. So let's get sector specific. Go through some names. Tell us what your outlook is and why. So in terms of who's in most danger right this moment, I think it's FCA. Hmm. And again, I think the results that, that are going to be seen, um, particularly, I, I think, as early as Q1, are a, they will provide insight into what's to come for others. I think they're all, they will all be affected, but... FCA because they they ran they ran production really really hot in 2018, got into day supply issues first, but I would pay very very close attention to that double digit decline in production, with no improvement in day supply for what they currently have on ground, which implies more production cuts, bigger production cuts to normalize inventory levels. And that's when the feed through and price happens, right? In the yeah, and that's and that's when when these production cuts start start, you know, filtering through the economy, it's going to mean more job cuts. It's right. going to be it's going to mean these folks that their communities rely on so heavily, um, you know, for for their consumption are no longer going to be consuming. Hmm. You know, and and I think and we that's mentioned that's why manufacturing at the margin matters 
when you're at a, a cyclical inflection point. It's there's it's not there's a, there's no denying that we're a services economy. Eighty percent of the U.S. economy is services. It doesn't matter though because manufacturing tends to drag the rest down with it because it's a reflection of the strength of the consumer. Right. So when you're talking about cyclical inflection points, for investors who look to macro for cues about how to invest and position their portfolios, what do you see based on your big picture analysis? So there are two things I'm following most closely right now to get a macro feel for what's happening in the economy. I'm watching how quickly home prices are declining, mm. especially on the coasts, because what the turnaround in the housing market is happening fairly rapidly. And I'm watching his day supply count mm. because it's so connected to the triggers and the only way that you can chase a cycle and be in front of it is to get down to the, into the weeds to the most granular turning point and follow them. And I'm also following layoffs because layoffs are running at such a high level. And by the way, it's not just layoffs of, of worker bees out there in the economy. Challenger also keeps track of C-suite movement of how mm -hmm. that that revolving door mm. and we've seen over 400 ceos lose their jobs this year and that tells you something about the future of layoffs because what are you trying to communicate if you're bringing in a new ceo change Some, change just, just somebody's going to come fits, in yeah. and say where's the fat to cut and, and i've got an that, objective look on it i can come in here and just clean house how does that change year over year is that a significant increase from oh where it's we've a been? tremendous increase no 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 i mean the, it's 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 beginning to actually make headlines even though it's a teeny little report um mm. because it's up so significantly over last i want to say it's it's up over maybe 20 percent over the prior year but we've been seeing increasing numbers of ceo turnover here for the last six months which precedes the turn in the labor market, in addition to the fact that 2018 globally and in the United States was the the record year in the history of mankind for mergers and acquisitions. Mm -hmm. Well, any well-paid consultant or investment banker will tell you that once you close a merger, that then at that point you can extract synergies. And extracting synergies means firing a, a lot of people. You know, just, just one example right now, the German government is being compelled to merge Deutsche Bank and Commerce Bank, presumably so they don't blow up the global financial system. Um, but if those two were to get married, that would involve over 30,000 employees being laid off. Hmm. Now just, but, but again, M&A was at a record here in the United States. M&A was at a record globally. And you can be as determined as you want as a Chinese policymaker to try and push enough stimulus into the global economy because that's effect effectively what you're doing when you print money. But if there are secular turns in the global economy, there's nothing you can do to slow this down. And it sounds like all the trends you're watching are accelerating. They, they have been. So I, I just want your help to think through this. Mm. I am watching what's happening with incentives very, very closely. Mm -hmm. So we're now in the ninth month that incentives have fallen. And back in 2008, 18, when I saw day supply drop dramatically, it was literally the easiest call I've ever made was to say incentives are going to fall and production is going to increase, mm -hmm. right? Both happen. Right. Incentives cut for, for the first time in 54 months, production increased in Q3, um, and a lot of what people are celebrating today is due to that. So my question now is this, we've had sequential declines in retail sales, mm -hmm. incentives aren't budging. We know that production is falling. So I'm trying to wrap my head around what happens next, because from a strategy standpoint, there's no nice way to put it. They are sacrificing production and jobs mm -hmm. ahead of margin. There's, right. no, there's no way to, to sugarcoat it. That this, is exactly what's happening. This is, this is an unholy alliance, and this is, to me at least, this is executive hubris on full display. You don't have that many cars piling up on the lots. And every time I write about autos, I get feedback from subscribers and they're like, yeah, I was just at a dealer and you know, they, 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 the, over, the overfill lot was filled next door to it. And right. you, you cannot have that kind of a buildup and just assume as CEO, seasonality dictates that the consumer is going to come roaring back in the second quarter. I'm just going to sit on this and protect my margins. Yep. And I have, and I have, so I have two follow-up questions. I personally think that the process of price discovery is going to be put forced because of the day supply figures. 
I think that it's been avoided for a couple different reasons. What you just mentioned, protecting margins, but also because if they lower prices on new cars, it's going to impact prices on used cars. Oh, yeah. And this is not the year to do that because there's 4.1. 4. 4. 1. 4.1 million yep. <laughs> leases maturing. I know it's kind of sad, isn't it? <laughs> all time high, right? So there's a lot of dry fire in the woods and all it needs is a spark. And I think yeah. these guys are aware of what's happening. And that roll off could be the spark. That roll off will be the spark. Auto manufacturers have been very vocal about they're ready for recession. They're recession proof. They, they, the, the, uh, the total vehicle sales can drop down to 10 million and they will, they will break even. So investors, please don't worry. <laughs> Everything is fine. Put, put those numbers in context in terms of where we are right now. 17 and 17, a half in 17 fairyland and a half, with right? seasonal adjustments. Hmm. So here's the thing. Again, I'm a student of history. I've gone back and I know what put General Motors out of business. And it was negative margins. The only way that they sell 10 million cars a year and not shut the doors is if they can maintain margins. Which is interesting and could be behind the reason why they're not cutting incentives. Now here's my question, and this is political. How do you think it goes over in this administration no. if you cut production ahead of margins and lose jobs? Oh gosh, talk about to toxicity. I mean, look, it, it, the, the irony of casting a light on General Motors to the extent that President Trump did is that it actually made things worse. It did. You know, you had the Halloween surprise. GM came out with this gorgeous earnings report. <laughs> right. It was just phenomenal. And then there was this little asterisk at the bottom that said, by the way, we're going to ask a third of our North American workforce to voluntarily leave. Several months later, that didn't work. They just fired them. Mm -hmm. So it, Trump can try to influence how these car makers operate. But when push comes to shove, they have magnificent pension obligations, yeah. retirement benefits that they have to think about. These are things nobody even talks about until you're in recession, but it is a pile on effect mm -hmm. if you see a sales decline of the magnitude that you're describing. Right, and the math only works in one way, and that's if you protect margins. And I don't think that cutting production ahead of margins is gonna go very off, it's gonna go very well. So final conclusions behind the asterisks, behind the seasonal adjustments, behind the data massaging, what, what do you think is going to be, we're looking at the six to 12 months? The final conclusion is that I think that pricing, again, the process of price discovery is going to be forced one way or the other. And when that happens, the dominoes just keep falling. They just keep falling. I wish I could be more positive, but I, it is my, it's my responsibility to my clients, to the viewers, to tell them how it is, whether it's pretty or, or ugly. And, and there's not a lot of pretty right now. And we should have been doing something about it, you know, six, seven months ago. And now we're at a critical point. On that optimistic note, Danielle, <laughs> I have a feeling you're not going to cheer me up either. Well, if you look at, at highways in the world, um, China used to have none. Now it has millions of miles of highway. Obviously, the United States is the same way. 17 million cars sold in, in 2018, 28 million in China. But if both of these markets hit a wall after a 20-year expansion in an extremely profitable, lucrative global industry, where would they turn to to get that next leg up of growth? Because I tell you what, India may have more people. It also happens to have 743 miles of highways. <laughs> that is not a typo. So they're not, there's, there's no global population pool that you can look to to continue supercharging global car manufacturing and all of the well-paying jobs that are produced, even as, as a society, we're turning to electric vehicles and ride sharing. So I see nothing to suggest to me that after 20 glorious years of profits, that the global auto industry is not going to now become a drag on global growth. Sounds like unconventional monetary policy is not going to be exited anytime oh, soon. Oh boy, no, we're definitely going to the zero bound. And and you know, it's, it's interesting you bring that up because if housing and autos do indeed continue to weaken, then the market is rightly pricing in Federal Reserve rate cuts this year. And as a rule of thumb, once the Fed hits the go button on rate cuts, you get one a month. Hmm. 
And if they're, as the politicians are clamoring for, 50 basis points instead of the 25 basis point hikes, if they reduce rates by 50 basis points, we could be at the zero bound in five months' time, just like that, and launching quantitative easing, which is part of why the stock market is so excited. QE infinity. It's always QE awesome. infinity. <laughs> Let's blow that balance sheet back. Get 8 million, 9 million, 10 million, because that's all bond traders talk to me about is just how big do you think it can get, Danielle? And I'm like, this is just phenomenal. Because if you prove that you cannot shrink the Fed's balance sheet, then you're refuting Ben Bernanke's original assertion that it was going to be temporary and that because it was temporary, it was not a formal monetization of the debt. Guess what? It is. On that note, guys, thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure. Hopefully next thank time you. we'll have you back with a more optimistic message. <laughs> yes, well, right before I get the new car. Yes, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, thank you. Daniel, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.